time for our weekly seminar, and today we have a great function as a presenter from uh, AOML. <laughs> AOML. <laughs> um, Rick presents himself, he gave me a paper, he very modest, he tell, calls himself a oceanographer, but yes. he's actually a very good oceanographer. <laughs> He um, received his PhD in oceanography in the University of Hawaii. Something familiar for Gary. Yes, I knew him well there. <laughs> in 1998. Go then, <laughs> <laughs> then he did his uh, postdoc in a uh, French place called Eiffremer, right? That's right. Uh, between 1998 and 2000, and I still remember the guy, Patrice Klein, he's still working there. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, then he worked in Florida State University, where he worked with uh, Kevin Spear, and they developed they developed inverse model for global meridional overturning circulation, which is called conveyor belt from hydrographic data. <coughs> um, in 2004, uh, Rick writes that he became a federal employee. So, is it a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> we'll find out next week. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, well, in, uh, well, he was in NOAA, uh, in, NOAA in uh, uh, Atlantic Oceanographic and Geological Laboratory, AML. Um, as the principal investigator, he supervises a huge number of uh, satellite track drifting points, 1,250 of them. And uh, he measures temperature and surface currents, and um, he's also participating in peer review publications. Uh, he also has other things. He is in, uh, involved in an international project called Pyretic, right. which involves people from uh, Brazil, France, and the United States. And uh, he's also working on uh, maintaining the area of the moor buoys in uh, tropical Atlantic, including the US led northeast extension of the main development region. Uh, now, Rick uh, served as a scientist in a number of oceanographic research cruises, and he helped to design ocean currents, I think it's a very neat thing, um, in, which is displayed in the ocean hall of the Smithsonian National um, Museum, of, Museum of Natural History. So, uh, out of all the stuff, he was he, he's going to present us today uh, <coughs> what we can learn from about oceanic spreading and steering uh, using the surface drifters. Great, all, thanks. All 1,250 uh, uh, That's right, and a lot more if you go back in time. Thanks a lot, Boris, for that introduction. So in, indeed, that's what I'll be talking about. Let me just jump straight to the instrument that I use most, and this is the array of instruments that we uh, manage uh, to, to keep in the, in the uh, world's oceans. It looks like this with a holy sock drogue uh, centered at 15 meters depth. Let's see if I can find the laser. There we go. So there's the drogue centered at 15 meters depth attached by a tether to a surface float where you have measures SST and you have the satellite transmitter and the batteries on it to send the data to the, to the satellites overhead. And compared to most oceanographic equipment, $1,500 is, is really, really inexpensive. And that's how we can have so many out there. It def definitely is a much, uh, much lower cost program than something like Argo, for example. So one of the ways that you can look at um, spreading in the ocean is absolute dispersion. The nice thing about this is it's a single particle calculation, so you, you can just take all the drifters you have in the data set and use, the, the, use them to make these kinds of calculations. You can uh, divide the velocity of your drifter into a time mean part or a low frequency part and an eddy fluctuating part about that. And there's a whole art to how you exactly do that and a lot of subtleties that I'm going to brush over. But let's just assume for the moment that you can have a u-bar plus a u-prime. Your position x is, of course, u-bar t plus x-prime, where x-prime is the integral of u-prime. Now, you can uh, quantify absolute dispersion as x-prime squared bar, an ensemble average over a bunch of these drifters. If you assume uh, homogeneous isotropic turbulence, as Taylor showed in 1921, you can then find that the dispersion is equal to this, where u r m s is sort of an eddy speed. It's the square root of u prime squared bar, so it's proportional to the eddy kinetic energy. Uh, u squared would be proportional to the eddy kinetic energy. And the uh, velocity or correlation r here is just the integral of uh, 1 over u prime t m. t m goes to infinity, integral of t m of u prime t, uh, t 
u prime t plus tau. So it's the autocorrelation of u prime. That limit of t going to infinity is obviously a problem with real data, and that's addressed uh, by uh, tackled by a number of different uh, ways with real data. One way is to take a long period of time that you believe is longer than the characteristic time scale by many times. Another is to go to the first zero crossing of the autocorrelation function. Another is to fit a prescribed autocorrelation function, which is a sinusoid times a, a decaying exponential, and then get the theoretical integral of that to infinity. So there's a lot of different ways of tackling this with real data, but that's really critical. Does that integral actually exist? Now there is a characteristic time scale for this, which is just the integral of the autocorrelation function from zero to infinity, and this is called the integral time scale, or the Lagrangian time scale. You can combine with the RMS to get an integral length scale. So those are the characteristic scales of Lagrangian motion, and they give you the effective diffusivity, which is one half rate of change of x prime squared bar, which is then related to these properties. So if you have t or u and or l and u, you can get an effective diffusivity, assuming that that uh, integral converges. There are some nice limits that Taylor showed us back in 1921. Uh, as a reminder, here's dispersion, here's the autocorrelation function. At short times, the autocorrelation function is 1, it's correlated with itself as tau goes to 0, and what you find is x prime squared bar, the dispersion, is just u prime squared times t squared. In other words, the uh, displacement grows linearly with time, which makes perfect sense if you think about it, and that's the below regime, very short times. And by very short, I mean time much smaller than the integral time scale. At very long times, assuming the integral converges, you find this relationship. It goes to 2, u, two eddy speed squared times the integral time scale times t. In other words, it now grows, dis displacement grows with the square root of time. And that's a random walk. So this is called the random walk regime. And when you look at the diff diffusion, you find that this then, because it's proportional to t, the derivative with respect to time becomes a constant. The diffusivity becomes a constant, which is the Taylor limit or the diffusive limit. So that's what happens if you go many, a long time, many, many integral time scales out. This has been used in a number, many, many drifter studies. This is one of the ones, one I did in 2002, looking at drifters in the North Atlantic, mapping out the time scale in days. And you can see it ranges from around two days in the very energetic regions to around four days in the more quiescent part of the subtropical gyre. The length scale, which tends to get larger in, any, in active regions, and the diffusivity, which you see ranges over a little over an order of magnitude here. <coughs> Another way of writing uh, the diffusivity as a tensor is to look at the autocorrelation between velocity displacements and the displacements themselves, as David showed in 91. Zerbus and O took advantage of this to calculate the diffusivity tensor. And what they found was if you look at the semi-minor or you look at the minor component of that, it is, they argued, the component that's the least contaminated by shear dispersion, which can magnify uh, dispersion considerably. And so that is effectively the uncontaminated part of the, of the dispersion, uh, the effective diffusivity, I should say. And that's what they used to make these maps using, again, the surface drifter network in the Atlantic and in the Pacific and in a paper a few years later in the Indian Ocean. When they compared the Rossby radius to the Lagrangian integral link scales they found, they got these relationships you see here for the Pacific, which looks like a somewhat correlated relationship, and the Atlantic, where there's almost no correlation at all. Uh, it's a very messy looking cloud of points, and that's one take home right there. There have been some papers which take, for example, eddy link scales derived from altimetry and use those to get diffusivities. Beware, because the Eulerian and the Lagrangian link scales are not the same thing. There is a limit where they are, but that's not necessarily what happens throughout the ocean, and in fact, the data does not support that. Now, that was single particle. If you're in a luxurious situation where you have more than one particle in one place, you can do some really nice things. I'm going to only talk about pair calculations here. There are higher order calculations you can do with three, four, five particles. But the more you have higher particles, the smaller your data set becomes. There are a lot of deployments in the ocean of drifters. There are very, very few trio deployments, and if you go to larger numbers, your data set becomes extremely limited. But let's look at pairs. So you have a pair deployed nearly together here. Their means, their center of mass is going to move with ut, but they're going to separate this distance d apart. And if we do an ensemble average over d squared, we have the analog of that single particle uh, dispersion. We have the relative dispersion. 
And what's really fascinating here is the relationship between the Eulerian wave number spectrum and the relative dispersion in, in a certain limit. So let's assume we have a 2D stationary turbulence that has a wave number spectrum, e to the k is k to the minus alpha. So it has this, alpha, this slope, minus alpha. You can show, uh, given by these references here, that the, uh, the diffusivity, the rate of change of dispersion, is proportional to d to the alpha plus 1 over 2 in the range 1 less than or equal to alpha, less than or equal to 3. In other words, if it's not too flat, if it's not flatter than minus 1 and not too steep, steeper, steeper than minus 3, you can figure out from the, from the diffusivity what that wave number slope is. Now, if alpha is greater than or equal to 3, uh, you basically find exponential separation. The particles separate exponentially. This range through here is what's known as local dispersion. What's happening in that range is as the particles are apart by a distance d, the rate of change, the rate of separation is governed by eddies of a comparable scale. In this limit here, very, very steep wave number slope, and that of course means that there's a lot more energy as you go to larger scales. The separation is exponential because the separation rate at, se at scale d is not driven by eddies of scale d, but by much larger eddies. And so that's, that kind of explains the difference between the two of them. And in fact, the, the, you, you kind of can quali qualitatively talk about how the dispersion looks in these two cases, with this being more of a kind of a stirring, this being more of a filamentation and stretching between larger eddies. Richardson's four-thirds law is something that pops up a lot in these discussions of the wave number spectrum. Uh, Going back to this three-dimensional problem in 1926, he, with an incredible amount of insight, proposed that the rate of spreading of particles is proportional to time cubed, which gives you a diffusivity proportional to the distance to the four, uh, RMS distance to the four-thirds power. So this is called the four-thirds law. Remember this, d proportional to t cubed. Uh, Kamal Garov in 1941 showed that this is the case for 3D turbulence fed by energy cascading all the way from the large scales down to the smallest scales of diffusion. Or disper yeah, of diffusion, then you basically get a spectral slope of e to the k is uh, k to the minus 5 thirds. Gives you this law, basically. Now in QG 2D turbulence, you have a slightly different situation. Energy input at the first baroclinic Raspi radius. And at larger scales, you have an energy cascade from here up and a wave number slope, as Krishnan showed, of k to the minus 5 thirds. Then you have the enstrophy cascade at smaller scales smaller than the baroclinic Rossby radius. And that is followed by, uh, it obeys k to the minus 3, exponential separation. So this is sort of what you'd expect from classic 2D quasi-geostrophic turbulence, if you looked at how particle pairs separate in the ocean. Another way of calculating this, rather than averaging in space, or excuse me, averaging in time, like you do with dispersion, is to average in space. So, Look, consider again the separation distance. I'm going to call it delta this time because this, sep this calculation is going to be uh, an averaging in space ultimately. I'm going to find a, a lambda such that the growth rate is given by an exponential separation. We'll assume up front. So it's exponential if lambda is constant, but more generally, lambda can vary with delta. Over the interval that we're going to average from delta to n, delta n plus 1, in which we'll assume lambda is approximately constant, we can write this. We just take a natural log of the previous equation. And then if we uh, put in a parameter alpha, we can write it this way. So lambda of delta n equals natural log of alpha over <coughs> the, time, the time, delta t, the time for the separation to grow from n to alpha n. And so basically we can plot lambda, calculated this way, as a function of delta. And we can uh, do the calculation now averaging in space instead of in time, or show it as a function of space. And we find that that slope of lambda as a function of delta varies by mi to minus 1, is consistent with a ballistic regime, minus 2 thirds, Richardson. If it's constant, exponential, uh, that should be pretty obvious. Minus 2 is diffusive. So this is another way of calculating this, and there are many, many more ways of calculating how the ocean spreads and stirs things, but I don't want to uh, get too much further into, into that. Well, here are some observations now in the real ocean, and there's not nearly as many as there are of absolute dispersion, and that's because there's so many fewer pairs and trios and such than there are individual drifters and floats in the ocean. This is an examination of subsurface floats. 
uh, well beneath the mixed layer. Uh, they looked at pairs in the eastern and western North Atlantic, and what they basically found was they didn't really resolve sub uh, uh, Rossby radius, but they certainly saw from the Rossby radius up to this transition point uh, a curve that's consistent with, uh, with Richardson's law behavior, and then it flattened out to, if you uh, believe that straight line, a constant. It's a little, little noisy there, but basically they argued that there is a, a clear transition out of Richardson behavior and to something which is at least roughly consistent with a constant diffusivity there. Olitro et al. in 2005 looked also at float pairs in the North Atlantic. And they argued that they resolved not only this Richardson's law behavior at larger scales, but at, uh, at, at scales larger than the Rossby radius. But they argued, and this is a semi-log plot, that they saw exponential separation at smaller scales. So this is the first time that I'm aware of that this was observed in, in the ocean with floats. Now, with drifters, at the surface, Lacoste and Ullman in 2003 had this really wonderful data set of a very large number of uh, code-style drifters. These are drifters that are drogued at about one meter that were deployed in the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, there were 731 of them deployed in two different deployments. Unfortunately, there weren't a lot of pairs deployed together. There were 140 that were, had less than one kilometer separation. But there were, uh, I think, some problems with, with the, some of those data. A lot of it was very coarse in time. And in the end, they, also, they had to rely pretty heavily on chance pairs, uh, drifters that happen to come together and then separate. And so taking chance pairs versus pairs that are deployed together may introduce a bias if there's something unusual about the flow where the drifters tend to converge together. And as I mentioned, the, the resolution of the data back in this period of time was pretty coarse. It would be a few fixes per day. And that can affect what you see at very small scales and short times. So what they found, though, when they looked at the dispersion, let me switch to the FSLEs. That's the clearest way of seeing it. Here is the finite scale Lyapunov exponents, lambda as a function of d is what they call it. And as I mentioned, a constant is exponential separation. The minus 2 thirds is Richardson's law. So they argued very clear exponential separation Here's the Baraclinic Rossby radius, and there's Richardson's law. That's incredibly consistent with 2D quasi-geostrophic turbulence. That's pretty much what you would expect to see if the spectral slope is k to the minus 3 here and k to the minus 4 thirds there. So uh, in February to March 2007, I had uh, funding to put out a large number of drifters in the Gulf Stream as part of Climode. And I was pretty much expecting to see the same thing, but I was going to have better temporal resolution because now we're roughly getting a fix about once an hour. And uh, I had uh, the chance to put a large number in uh, intentional pairs and trios. In fact, I put them in trios so I would have um, three pairs per uh, batch deployment. What you're seeing here is uh, TMI. Uh, and AMSRI emerged microwave SST degrees Celsius. And the first of the batch of drifters that I deployed as we crossed the Gulf Stream front, and the colors are the temperatures measured by the drifters on the same scale. So I deployed 60 of them in 16 trios and six pairs. Uh, it worked out to be about 1.2 hours uh, between fixes, and I interpolated that to regular hourly intervals for the calculations I'll show you. You can see how they jump forward to here, start swirling around some eddies and rings. And I'll just march forward in time, and you can see how the array kind of dispersed, almost all on the south side of the Gulf Stream front and the Gulf Stream recirculation region. Now we're moving into warm waters coming in from the south and moving into summer. It would have been much nicer to be out then. <laughs> By the way, I do not recommend going out there in February. It was unpleasant. So I want to point out one really curious anomalous pair. This is not normal, uh, but it does show you the kinds of things that are out there when you, when you accidentally deploy a pair in the right place. This was part of a trio, but one of the three left fairly quickly during uh, this period of time. Let me first show you. So they're deployed here. The pair moves around, moves around, and then they finally start separating after about 30 days. This is their separation distance between the two that stayed together a long time as a function of day after release. And you can see it very, very small. It jumped up to over 10 kilometers, but then fell back down again. And until day 30, they basically 
acting like they were almost glued together before they suddenly flew apart. They flew apart once they got about three kilometers apart, and then boom, off they kind of shot from each other. When you look at the two of them, starting here, follow up, and you'll see them spinning around the center of mass. And as I mentioned, once they got to about three kilometers, they moved apart very, very quickly. They, they did separate initially, they reconverged, and then all through this period of time is when they were basically, it looks very much like they were stuck within a very intense cyclonic mesocell vortex. Really impressive feature that was out there in the winter Gulf Stream area. Now, let's quantify across all my pairs. One of the drifters died, unfortunately, and in the end I had 55 pairs with the earliest fix less than 700 meters. So I used those to make this calculation of dispersion, d squared, as a function of t. And you see uh, this is uh, zonal, solid, and meridional dashed. Uh, and the error bars on the zonal part, the error bars in the meridional are about the same scale. So there, from the RMS displacement of about 1.5 kilometers all the way out to 300 to 500 kilometers, it's basically following that dashed gray line. And that dashed gray line is Richardson's law of behavior. And you notice, if I put in an exponential here, and I'll show another plot a little later, that you can arguably fit part of this curve with an exponential, but there's no way you could fit it all the way up to the Rossby radius of deformation, this line right here. So that means that sub-deformation scales, this definitely looks like Richardson's law of separation, which is not what, um, what Lacoste and Ullman showed with those Gulf of Mexico drifters. This was very different behavior, not what I was expecting to find. Let's look at way out at this transition from Richardson's law to these, this alternate curve. And that curve is with uh, the distance growing is a the RMS distance growing with the square root of time. That's the uh, Taylor or diffusive limit. And you can see that I can fit a constant diffusivity onto those two lines, merid meridional and zonal lines. It's, uh, there's a factor of two for relative dispersion, so if I divide by two, I find the, the single particle effective diffusivity of something like 1.5 to 3 times 10 to the 4 meters squared per second. I can, of course, make a single particle calculation as well. I've done this with all the drifters in the data set right there. That's log 10 meters squared per second. Take all the climb mode drifters, interpolate that onto that, and there's the mean I get for the semi-minor axis, which is pretty close to what I found with the... Uh,